It was at this point that the council said to John Huss, Will you admit that your writings are full of false teachings? To which he said, I am ready to retract anything in them if I am shown from Holy Scripture where I am in error. Hey everyone, Pastor BJ here, coming to you from Kirkmont Church. One of the most important things to remember anytime we study church history is that we should learn not simply from the places where the church had victory or found success, but we also have to learn lessons from where the church has failed. We can sometimes get the impression that church history is men and women being faithful against tyrannical governments, against forces of the world, empires, that sort of thing. But oftentimes, it's faithful men and women standing up against corrupt forces within the church herself. And so today, we turn our attention for a good example of this to another profile of church history. Our profile this week takes us back to October 2nd in the year 1412, to a place called Bethlehem Chapel, which was in the city of Prague, Bohemia, in modern-day Czech Republic. There were some civil authorities that had entered the city looking for a man named Jan Hus, or in English we call him John Hus. They had orders to arrest him, to burn his writings, and to level Bethlehem Chapel to the ground. Now, John was a very popular man in the city, and when the citizens found out what they were up to, a, an uprising stirred, and they ended up forcing the authorities outside of the city, and John Huss was ultimately protected. So, what had John Huss done to cause such a scene? Well, to answer that question, we actually have to go back to the beginning. So, John was actually born in Bohemia to a very humble family, his father passed away shortly after he was born, and he was raised by a godly mother who did everything she could to see to it that he had a solid education. And eventually, he was able to go to the University of Prague as, uh, on scholarship because they were poor. And on the day when she dropped him off, before she left, she knelt down beside him and prayed this simple prayer, God, bless my son's life. And that is a prayer that God would answer in ways that she simply had no idea. Now, when he was at the university, he excelled. Even though he was from humble beginnings, he did extraordinarily well academically, and he eventually became a priest. He was devoted to his work as a minister. He um, focused on the average person, speaking to them in their own language, teaching in Czech rather than in uh, Latin and he became very, very popular. Now, one of the things that he discovered as he was in the ministry is that there were a lot of folks within the clergy who were simply careerists. They were lazy, they were greedy, they didn't take the faith seriously, and John simply did not care about what they thought of him, and he told them what he thought about them. He continued to teach to the average person, refusing to focus in on Latin, and eventually, he caused a big enough stir that the Pope deemed him a heretic. And this was when they dispatched the civil authorities to go find him. Now, as I mentioned just a moment ago, he was not arrested. He was actually saved. But he was not allowed to be back in the city. The Pope actually put a ban on preaching and ministry in the city of Prague. Can you imagine that? Now, John obviously didn't stop doing that. He continued to find places like out in the middle of fields and in faraway places and everywhere he went, crowds followed. He would continue to write letters to his people. He would go sneak in and do visits. But after a period of about two years of being on the run, eventually he was betrayed and he was arrested. Now, one of the things that happened at this point was they had to, to figure out what to do with John. Here he refuses to quit teaching in the local language. He refuses to quit criticizing the clergy for all sorts of things. And he keeps pointing to the scriptures, saying, Here, here's where we need to focus our attention. 
Well, eventually, there's a church council that's called to figure out what to do with him in the city of Constance in Switzerland. And it was there that they approached him and said, Will you admit that your writings are full of false teachings? And triumphantly, he stands up and he says this to them. I am ready to retract anything in them if I am shown from Holy Scripture where I am in error. So, as you can see here, John's a pretty bold man. He's willing to stand upon the scriptures and to say, hey, if you're going to criticize me or my writings, then you need to show me from scripture where, where I'm wrong. Rather than actually engaging, they laugh at him. And ultimately, he is condemned to death. And so, on the day that he is to be executed, they march him out. And rather than simply executing him quietly, they make a scene. They make up this hat then draw little devils on it and shove it onto his head so that everybody knows this is an unfaithful heretic. And eventually he is tied to the stake and he is ultimately burned. And the whole time there are people saying, just, just give, up, give up your teachings, just admit that you're wrong. And he refuses to do so. In fact, these are his last words. I shall die with joy today in the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which I have preached. Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. So, thus John Huss was executed. Now, there are many things we could say about the life of John Huss, but I just want to point to four very brief things that we can take away. The first one is... Mothers who pray for their children have a powerful effect. Mothers, pray for your children. God hears those prayers. And John Huss is a great example of that. The second thing that I think is important to, to focus in on is that oftentimes we have to be willing to fight against forces from within the church. We have to be willing to call the church back to the scriptures the authority of the ministers, and they do have authority, is founded upon the Word of God. They don't have authority over the Word of God. And John Huss realized that the church had gotten that backwards, and he sought to correct that, and he, it cost him his life. He fought against the church for the gospel, and I think we need to remember that oftentimes that's where our battle has to be. The third thing that we should note is that John's focus on preaching and ministering to the average person is one that we must never forget. The church must never become an elitist institution. There will certainly be elite individuals within the church, powerful people, rich people, scholars, athletes, pop, whatever the case might be. There's nothing wrong with being really, really good at what you do. But we must never forget to preach and teach and minister the gospel into the lives of the average person who goes to work, who takes care of their kids, who lives an ordinary, um, an ordinary life. John Huss never forgot that. The issue for him was teaching in their local language, but it was also caring about those who had been forgotten. The church must always be a place where we don't forget about the average person. And the fourth thing that I think we need to take away is if for, for many of you, the story of John Huss sounds remarkably like the story of Martin Luther. And we almost universally start the story of the Reformation with Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the, to the castle door. But the story of the Reformation really begins before Martin Luther. And John Huss is a great example of that. So, as we look back on church history, I encourage you to look at examples like John Huss for what it means to minister to the average person, to have courage, to be willing to seek to correct the church, and to do all of it in the name and the joy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go and be blessed.